Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Ellen Nakashima. I'm a national security reporter at the Washington Post. I'm excited to be moderating this program. I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Fiona Hill, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, former senior director for Europe and Russia at the National Security Council, and author of the new book, There is Nothing for You Here, Finding Opportunity in the 21st Century. Before she became a celebrated foreign policy expert and key witness in the 2019 impeachment trial of then President Donald Trump, Fiona Hill was a coal miner's daughter from Northern England in a town where the last of the coal mines had closed. There's Nothing For You Here draws on her own journey out of poverty and her unique perspective as a policymaker to warn that America is on the brink of social economic trouble and an authoritarian swing that could rival modern Russia. We'll be discussing a lot in the next hour, and I want to ask your questions too. So if you're watching along with us, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube. We'll be getting to them later in the program. Thank you, Fiona Hill, for joining us. Oh, thanks, Ellen. It's great to be here. So over several hours in November 2019, you vaulted from a behind-the-scenes expert on Russia and Eurasia to an international figure, to someone whose picture would be on the front pages of newspapers around the world, you testified with candor and clarity about President Trump's coercive dealings with Ukraine during the impeachment hearing. But while you touched on, on that topic, you did not dwell on it, nor did you write a political tell-all like a number of former Trump administration officials. Rather, with your newfound international platform, you wrote a highly personal exploration of how post-industrial decline in three countries you know well, the US, the UK, and Russia, has fed the rise of populism. Fiona Hill, why did you decide to write such a book and why now? Well, it was really um, a decision that I took after the testimony and you know, really in the kind of aftermath of it and the response to many of the letters that I got from people, hundreds of people from all the way around America and also from the United yeah. Kingdom in particular, but also around the world. Uh, I think, you know, some people had found that my opening statement, my personal statement at the beginning of the public testimony really resonated with them. And that in itself was an unusual thing for me to do. I'd never testified before Congress before by putting myself into the beginning of the opening statement. I mean, I testified before Congress many times before, mm. but I didn't feel at that point you know, a, a previous point that I had to explain who I was and where I was from. But basically, all of the fact witnesses who'd been called up to testify in November of 2019 and in, in the closed door depositions that took place basically this month in October of 2019 had had their characters impugned. We were kind of accused of being deep state coup plotters, of being un-American. Um, those of us who were immigrants like myself and Lieutenant Colonel Vindman and Maria Yovanovitch, our ambassador uh, to Ukraine, um, were all accused of being, you know, perhaps traitors. People were saying, you know, what's with them with their, you know, dual nationalities and their, you know, perhaps their dual loyalties to different countries. Uh, members of uh, the professional staffs of U.S. Um, agencies were being kind of accused of being part of these cliques that were disconnected from the, the rest of the United States. They were not normal people somehow. They were unelected yeah. bureaucrats who were trying to pervert, you know, the kind of the course of um, politics. And I wanted to explain, no, we weren't. Look, we're just like other Americans. And many of us have come from similar backgrounds to me, not just immigrants, but people who've come from hard scrabble backgrounds and who sought out education and then wanted to serve their country. And I you know, felt that I understood from my own personal journey from the coal fields of the north of England, you know, bizarrely to the White House, from the coal house to the White House, as I describe it in the book, 
about how personal biography can really explain and help to illuminate some of these larger trends. Because I'd experienced it all. I was very cognizant the whole time, even from being a kid, of kind of living in a history, in a world that was changing, mm-hmm. and a world that led from industrial decline to populism. And populist leaders who were basically saying, I'm going to fix it for you. I'm going to make you know the country great again. And I'm going to bring back all the things that you have lost. Yeah. And so I wanted to explain that. And really in response to a lot of the letters of people writing to me and asking me for, you know, to engage with me on discussing some of the things that I brought up in the testimony, some of the personal things that I'd said, I thought, well, the best way to do this is probably to write a book. And so that's what I've been doing, you know, since we've been in lockdown. Um, <laughs> I started working on the book right. a year ago, you know, this month uh, in, in terms of really writing it. Well, let's step back a little because I think this is a question that many in the audience will have that you, you know, you are Washington foreign policy circles. You're known as nonpartisan. You'd work for the Bush and Obama administration. So Republican and Democratic You're affiliated with the Brookings Institution, which is centrist, mainly in the little center left. You note in your book that you took part in the 2017 Women's March in Washington, the day after Trump's inauguration, and you marched around the White House in protest against Trump's policies that were considered anti-woman. And yet you, shortly after that, you accepted a job in the White House. Why did you go to work for an administration headed by a politician, policies you openly protested? Well, I was protesting, like many other women, the misogyny, the sexism, you know, the the commentary that, you know, was made. There were a lot of things, you know, to be deeply disturbed about in the way that um, President Trump had campaigned. But I went in there precisely to do something about Russia. So the motivation was coming out of the previous public service that you've laid out. I had been the national intelligence officer for Russia and Eurasia from 2006 to 2009, spanning the Bush administration and the beginning of the Obama administration. In the interim, when I'd gone back to the Brookings Institution, because I'd been loaned out then, I'd been running the center on the US and Europe. I'd been really steeped in everything that was going on in national security related to Russia, you know, broader concerns in Europe and elsewhere. And I'd been watching with alarm you know, what was happening in the 2016 presidential election campaign. I knew that the Russians were launching an influence operation. It wasn't just you know, targeted at Clinton and Trump, the two main um, candidates uh, from the Democratic and Republican Party. It was across the board. They were trying to discredit our elections and our presidential system. And I knew why, because Putin thought that the United States had been trying to prevent him from returning to the presidency of Russia in 2011, 2012. It was in a way of him getting his revenge uh, for what he thought was American intervention. I've written a book about Vladimir Putin. I knew that all this was happening and I wanted to do something about it. And when I was actually asked quite unexpectedly, because I hadn't been in part of the campaign. I never expected that to happen. I thought, well, I've got to do something. I you know, had plenty of warnings from colleagues about just you know, the, the framing that you gave to me then about, look, you're going to an administration run by this guy, somebody you know, you're, you clearly don't have an affinity with here. You know, you've got to be very careful about this. I took those warnings to heart. I paid attention to them. But I similarly had exhortations from other colleagues and you know my own inclination was going there and trying to do something this is public service we're trying to push back against you know what the russians have done you know i, I was focused on the national security challenge mm. in the course of my experience there though i became deeply disturbed about our own domestic politics and i came out of the administration in some respects a sort of changed person more focused on the domestic front than i had been on the foreign policy front and our domestic challenges are a national security crisis. Absolutely. Did, did you, you say you wanted to help the administration avoid being hoodwinked by the Russians. Did, did you think you could go in when you went in that you could shape the policies of a man who as a candidate showed an open affinity for the strongman, Vladimir Putin? Well, let's just say the people who were talked to me about coming in um, had an idea uh, uh, on their own that I would sit down with them and with him, you know, kind of directly to give the kind of briefings that I'd given in the past to Bush and to um, Obama. I mean, they were people who would, you know, work with Trump, some of them being on his campaign, you know, others were, you know, working with him immediately after the inauguration. Of course, as soon as I get there, then I realize that this is not feasible. And it's not just because of his affinity for Putin. In fact, you know, mm. kind of, it's more about me as a woman, you know, mm. kind of, you know, and who am I as an expert? Um, and, you know, uh, from Trump's own uh, personal viewpoint, he just wants to sit down with Putin 
and basically turn on his charm, you know, make this personal connection with Putin. He's not interested at all in what somebody's going to tell him about Putin. He wants to get in there and meet with Putin himself. He doesn't care whether it's me, it's Rex Tillerson, who'd been the CEO of ExxonMobil and is the Secretary of State, and you know, who is, you know, supposedly shaping, you know, the relationship for him. It's, you know, General McMaster, who was the first national security advisor I worked with, it's General Mattis, you know, the Secretary said he doesn't care, the Secretary of Defense, he doesn't care, you know, what anybody really has to say. It's kind of, yeah, 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 I just want to get on and meet with Putin or talk to Putin. And they were men, they weren't women, and he, yet he also regarded their advice and their views. Yeah, I mean, that was obvious. I mean, it, it, initially, you know, he did listen to some degree to things that they had to say that were shaping this out, particularly because of the backlash from what had happened in 2016 and the prevailing belief in some circles that Trump had not really been legitimately elected, that the intelligence services of Russia had swayed the election in his favor. And of course, you know, he was really reacting to that. And he had to rely on others, you know, for some time to make those initial introductions to Putin to the other Russians, because, of course, everything that he did vis-a-vis -vis Putin was massively scrutinized. But, you know, again, this was only temporary. After a while, he didn't really want to listen to them. He'd take his intel briefs from the CIA briefers, but he just, you know, in terms of advice on how to handle Putin, he just didn't want to know. <laughs> Note in your book that you dealt with the trauma of working inside the Trump White House by treating it as a social anthropological study noting the parallels with upheavals you'd seen elsewhere in, in the world. Political machinations around the Trump White House turned out to be as dirty as the Kremlin's you wrote. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, that was actually sort of jarring for me. I mean, I realized when I came in, being not a political person, um, I was not part of a campaign. I'd not been in these political inner circles. When I was in the government previously as national intelligence officer, my job was to you know, get all sorts of information from across the government and the intel community and do briefings for the president. But I wasn't supposed to be doing briefings on a political basis. I wasn't a member of a political party. And as an immigrant, you know, I was an outsider in many respects to the system who had, you know, kind of learned, you know, kind of a lot about how things functioned. But I was really an outsider still to, you know, the kind of the political intrigue. I didn't know who half the people were. You know, that might sound astounding, but, you know, they were only people I'd maybe read about in the Washington Post, you know, <laughs> that you and other people were writing about. I'd never met them before. I didn't know the kind of inner workings of some of the congressional stuff. I didn't, you know, know who many of these people were around Trump. I, I mean, I'd maybe read about them a little bit, but I didn't know them. I had no, you know, idea of how they were all interacting together until I saw it at first hand. And then, you know, as you said, that's a quick, you know, kind of um, immediate uh, education, you know, fast uh, track to uh, getting information on uh, this kind of environment. And it really did strike me just like the Kremlin. I'd spent a lot of time passing criminology, who's who, how are they connected to Putin? And suddenly I realized I needed to do the same for the American president. That was a bit of a shock because it wasn't that, you know, the American president was up operating in a well, you know, uh, honed, uh, established set of institutions. This was a president, Donald Trump, who wanted to run the country without the government. Uh, he wanted to run it out of the White House like he'd run his personal business. Well, you're, let's move to um, another topic in your book, your, your accent. It, to most Americans, it marks you as British and thus automatically cultured. But in the UK, in fact, it marked you as someone from the Northeast, from impoverished coal country, akin to America's Appalachia. Write that it took years of hard work and determination, which got you to a prestigious university in Scotland and then to Harvard, to shed the stigma of that accent. Write that it was much harder to overcome barriers of class in England than in the United States. In America, race more than class, poor people of color face double whammies, was and is the more significant social challenge. Did those differences mean anything in terms of the conditions make our societies vulnerable to populist politics? I think they do, because, you know, it's those barriers to opportunity that, you know, uh, hold people back that, you know, put them not just in social boxes, but also in socioeconomic boxes. That really um, stokes grievance. I mean, if you feel you can't get ahead, that the whole system is stacked against you, you're often looking for someone to fix it for you. Um, or, you know, you're also, after a period of time, becoming so frustrated that you'll be willing to sort of blow up the system. 
And I think we've seen that over and over again in our electoral system. People feel frustrated. They feel the system isn't working for them. Um, it may be from socioeconomic grievances, grievances because of you know who they are, you know how uh, society perceives them, and they you know kind of be willing to take you know in some cases extreme measures to yeah. um, to see change. And you know it plays in so many different ways. Uh, you know, as you said, when I first came to the United States, I write this in about in the book. It was actually a bit of a shock to the system, first of all, seeing the racial divisions in the United States. I mean, I'd come from a country that was also go, undergoing demographic change and, um, you know, with um, uh, racial differentiation. But I came from um, a country that was also, you know, we have um, five recognized groups in the, the United Kingdom that, you know, were, were the main kind of stay of ethnic politics, you know, because we'd seen the rising nationalism in the period in which I was growing up, a Scottish nationalism, Irish, you know, nationalism. And the, we had the troubles in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, between the Catholic and Protestant communities there. And the Irish, you know, uh, question was uppermost in everyone's minds. Welsh nationalism. I mean, there'd been actually attempts during the investiture of Prince Charles as Prince of Wales to actually have Welsh nationalist terrorist attacks, you know, against um, his investiture as, you know, kind of an outside, you know, entity being sort of brought in and, you know, declared Prince of Wales. There were also traveller, Romani and um, uh, Gypsy and um, Irish travellers. My family had come from all of these different uh, backgrounds. I was kind of a very British, you know, and kind of my, my background. And race relations were very acute and also in the UK when I was growing up in the United States, but in big cities. My hometown was 98% white because industry had disappeared. There was no opportunity, you know, the title of the book, there's nothing for me there. <laughs> there's nothing for anybody there. So nobody was moving in. We weren't getting immigrants moving into the north of England into, you know, kind of jobs because there weren't any jobs. So I was in a you know very different um, environment where class really counted, accents, place. There was a lot of discrimination against people from the north of England. I mean, it was wasn't easy to move to London. It wasn't. It was easier to move out of the country. Yeah. And then I get to the US, and suddenly I'm accepted. in 1989, right? 1989. Yeah. I come to Boston, and I had no idea that Boston had just gone through this massive trauma of the desegregation of the public schools. And in fact, they hadn't desegregated at all after the busing of students, you know, from black and white communities across the, you know, the public schools, the, stu the, the schools had flipped from being majority white to majority black. And there'd been, you know, white flight out to the suburbs. I didn't know anything about this. I figured, you know, with the civil rights movement, you know, which had been, you know, a feature of my birth. I mean, I mean, you know, the same age, 1965, and born as the you know, the Civil Rights Act and you know the Voting Rights Act coming along later. I kind of figured it was all resolved. And when I got to Harvard, I was like, whoa, okay, what's happening here? And it was again a crash course in race in the United States. And I understood right away that that was a barrier that framed everything else. You know, your um you know, your racial background. And then on top of that, you know, kind of if you had gender or class, which class exists in the United States, it's been subsumed, uh, you know, behind racial uh, divisions and gender, you know, obviously plays a role in here too. And I understood that, you know, people were even more disadvantaged in an American sense than they might have been, you know, in the atmosphere and environment I was growing up with in the United Kingdom. And that really shifted my view of America as the land of opportunity, land of opportunity for me, absolutely, but not land of opportunity for everyone who was born in the United States. Interesting. And, and at what point and how did it dawn on you that what you had witnessed growing up in Bishop Auckland in County Durham in England was playing out in America too? That came up, you know, over time. I think the time sequencing is, you know, somewhat different. My father had actually wanted to emigrate to the United States, to Pennsylvania or West Virginia in the 1960s uh, to work in coal mines that were still open then. Of course, you know, if he had done to the Lehigh Valley, which is where he was thinking the same, you know, coal mining towns were really hard hit in the, later in the 70s and 80s when the mines closed and then the steelworks and everything went there too. So, of course, I'm in the United States in 1989 starting to see that happen. And in um, Boston, um, it was it was all around the the northeast of the United States. That period, just like the northeast of England that I left, wasn't doing well. I mean, Boston and the northeast corridor of the United States bounced back later on, but in that period in 1989, they weren't. You know, there were areas around Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, East Cambridge. You know, there was um, all the old textile mill towns where the factories had been lost. 
East Cambridge, you know, all the factories were closing down and MIT was starting to kind of cannibalize the buildings and turn them into labs, for example. Somerville, you know, which is where most of the graduate students live, you know, the graduate students cruelly called it Slummerville because this was, you know, kind of a, towns of de- a town of decaying triple deckers where, you know, the people who owned them were renting them out to students and they were all in precarious state because people had bought them as investment properties when the car factories were open, the meatpacking plants, and these were all closed. So I was, I was sort of surprised to see the same thing. It wasn't what I ex- anticipated. And, you know, in the United States, in the time that I've lived here since 1989, I've seen the same phenomenon where wealth, the innovation, the new economy has become concentrated. In the US, it's much more spread out, obviously, than it is in the UK, where it's been concentrated in London, mm. and really the whole South and a few university um, cities. But great swathes of the country in the United States have been left out of the new economy. And I married into um, a, a lot, very large family from the Midwest, spread across the Midwest, and started to see as I began to visit them from essentially 1990 onwards, um, when I first started dating my husband, you know, sort of seeing the same phenomenon there too, and, you know, really gave me pause for thought. Let me ask you a, a little bit about your Russia studies background. You write about being acutely aware as a child of, of the prospect of nuclear war between Russia and the West, of having hiding places in the fields should a nuclear bomb ever fall. It's a pretty weighty concern for a 12-year-old girl. Is that what pushed you to study Russian and, and the Soviet Union? That was exactly it. I mean, basically from 1977 to 1987, the United uh, Kingdom was in the crosshairs of a standoff over um, the stationing of missiles in Europe, the so-called Euro missile crisis, which goes on for a decade. And this is the the Soviet Union was stationing SS-20 missiles in Eastern Europe, and the United States was stationing Pershing missiles in Western Europe. I mean, many people listening to this probably recall that. And throughout that period, there were war scares. There was incredible tension building up. And in November 1983, for example, we know now from declassified documents that the Soviet Union completely misread a series of uh, US uh, exercises um, that were intended, obviously, for uh, military preparedness. But the Soviet Union actually thought that maybe the United States were preparing for a first strike, nuclear strike. This is, you know, 1983. And, you know, the whole period in the 1970s, we would have these public service warnings in in the United Kingdom. And, you know, this is kind of pretty low tech. They'd send around some of these warnings on a reel, film reel, you know, to be shown during our school assemblies. You know, they'd be projected onto a screen. You'd have a very posh British BBC voice, you know, telling you about, you know, nuclear war, where to hide in your house, you know, these public service houses. And maybe, you know, had them on, you know, US television as kids. I've seen some, you know, ads, you know, warning about nuclear war from a similar sort of period in the US. But these were pretty frightening. This sort of tinny, very posh BBC, British Queen's English voice, you know, telling us poor people to find a, a room in your house with no windows. Well, my house was really small. There wasn't anywhere with no windows apart from the cupboard under the stairs and you know we'd think about could we all fit in there and if you were caught outside when the nuclear sirens went you know for you should look for shelter or throw yourself in a ditch and my sister and I would be really scared by you know these um as every all the other kid were we would be walking out and it was a rural area my hometown and we'd often be out in the fields and we'd be looking around going where would we throw ourselves if we hear the air raid siren what about this ditch you know what about over there would we hide under a hedgeway and you just said that you you're 11 12 years old and you're thinking about this all the time and There was an incident in my school when we were all preparing to take our A-levels. These were the exams that you took, a bit like the SATs when you were applying to university and and college or the next thing. And people saying, why should we bother taking these? We're all going to be dead. We're going to be blown up in a nuclear exchange. Many members of my family were in protest, you know, older relatives um, and the campaign for nuclear disarmament. One of my father's elderly relatives, or my uncle Charlie, he said, you know, Fiona, you should go and study Russian because we need to figure out why they want to blow us up. And he said it in a bit more colourful language. <laughs> kind of, it was like, what's happening here? So I thought, yeah, maybe I should. Maybe I could become a translator and maybe I could, you know, help, you know, kind of explain. <laughs> I didn't think I would end up, you know, kind of where I did. I just thought, you know, yeah, but good point. Maybe I should study Russian. And look at where it's led you. <laughs> oh, no, exactly. But that was the time. It was terrifying. You know, yeah, as anybody yeah. will, from that era will tell you. And on either side, it turns out of the wall. 
Well, you also write that over the course of your studies, it suddenly dawned on you that the Cold War, the ide ideological veil of the struggle between capitalism and communism had concealed the fact that the UK, USSR and US had much in common. And once you lifted the veil, you could see the touch points beneath, especially if you knew what to look for. In particular, what were the touch points between Russia or the Soviet Union and the U.S.? And why did they strike you so? Well, the touch points between the U.K. and the Soviet Union touched me first. And then it was you know, when I got to the United States, I could see it happening again as well. Because in 1987, I won a scholarship from the British Council to go to study in uh, Moscow for a year. I mean, this actually ends, you know, um, resolving my fears about nuclear war because I'm there when Gorbachev and Reagan sign the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, resolving the Euro missile crisis that has, you know, dominated 10 years of, you know, my childhood and adolescence. So that was a bit of a relief. But I am in Moscow and, you know, this is the first big city I've lived in. I was shocked. I was like, my God, what state this place is in? This is the capital of a superpower? I mean, it was a, an amazing cultural experience being there, the opera, the Bolshoi, you know, the, the ballet, I mean, you name it. But the place was falling apart. And, you know, it was, it was also, you know, remarkably rural, even in a big city. I, I write in the book about how shocked I was to find a little wooden house in the shadow of the um, amazing, you know, Stalinist building of the Russian um, or the Soviet foreign ministry that had chickens running around in the garden, just like in my granddad's back garden, you know, back in his coal mining village. And you, you went a little bit outside of Moscow and there were carts on the street and unpaved roads in these villages that people were kind of commuting in. And there was no food in the shops and things were, you know, kind of empty because this was the period in which the Soviet central planning had broken down. You know, in my um, hometown too, shops were boarded up. There was nothing in the shops. That wasn't because the supply system had broken down. It was just because people had no money because we were all unemployed, you know, to buy things. And I was just so struck about how similar it was. I remember the Soviet Union was a country filled with blue collar working class workers, smokestack factories. Everyone was a worker. Everyone at home was a worker. And then I get to the United States, and you know, as I described earlier, I get to Boston when Boston's you know, not in the best of shape. Oh, the suburbs around it, all of New England, the textile mills have um, closed down. Workers in smokestack industries are having the same problem. And you know, kind of that's where the connection starts to be. You see these big industrial powers, the great industrial powers of World War II that build themselves up afterwards, with a heavy emphasis on mass manufacturing, are in the throes of um, major industrial change. And the workers, the people who worked in those big factories in all those three countries, are forced to try to retool. And in some cases, they can't because they're stuck in places that no, no new industry is going to come into. And they also have, you know, basically skill sets that are not adaptable. They've been trained to work in an old mass manufacturing economy. They don't have the educational skills, um, the qualifications you know, to really do anything else. And they're kind of stuck in place like the people who'd bought those triple deckers in Somerville and having to rent them out to Harvard graduate students to make some money because their jobs had gone away and they couldn't move because they owned that property there. And that's what breeds the resentment that can be exploited so ably by some politicians. Yeah, because people want the jobs to be brought back for them. And that's of course what Trump and you know others promised, will bring back those jobs. Some of the passages that resonated with me the most were the ones that captured your experience as a professional woman, whether at Brookings, at a Valdai discussion club, meeting with Putin or at the White House. You memorably recount how President Trump mistook you, the senior director for Russia and Europe, for secretary. How he called you darling when he wanted to know if you could type up a press release about a call he'd had with Putin. How did you feel about that in the moment? And how did you go on to deal with or process that? Well, by that point, that wasn't the first person who would ever call me darling, honey, sweetie. You but know, the president. But it was the president. Exactly right. I was like, whoa, OK. But, you know, as I'd already you know, kind of mentioned, I mean, we knew that um, Trump was misogynistic. I mean, he <laughs> made that crystal clear during the campaign. Everything that had been written about him, you know, suggested the same. So, you know, I mean, I... I should have seen it coming. Uh, it's just, you know, in that moment, of course, you know, you get that jolt where you think, really? And, you know, I was hoping that the other men in the room would help me out. 
the Mr. President. This is Fiona Hill. She's actually, you know, your Russia's senior director, not the secretary, but at least, you know, they could have said who I was, but they didn't. And, you know, I, I mean, what was I going to do? You know, I, in the moment, I couldn't think of what to do. I, you know, in retrospect, I would love to say, ah, sorry, Mr. President, I didn't realise you're speaking to me. I'm, you know, Fiona Hill, your um, Russia senior director, of Russia and Europe at the National Security Council. What is it that you'd like me to do? <laughs> you know, those are all the things you kind of think about, you know, afterwards. Um, he would probably still ask me to go off and type up, you know, the press release. Why couldn't I? Maybe that's part of, you know, the job. In fact, other, you know, senior directors were doing that. I just wasn't aware that that was what I was being asked to do. But, you know, the, it was a way, of course, that he addressed me, darling. You know, he clearly thought that I was the secretary, you know, where I was sitting, you know, just the immediate assumption. And, you know, my entire professional life, of course, those assumptions have been made, um, you know, as I relate in the book. I mean, time and time and time again, the assumption was as the woman in the room, you were the secretary, the person was going to go and make tea. I recount how, you know, I had this um, encounter the very famous, you know, kind of U.S. executive who, you know, thought I was the tea lady at a conference while I was actually his fellow speaker. It's just going to be me and him on stage. And, I, you know, I made a note to self not to wear a black blazer with a white top again because, yeah, they'll think you're part of the catering stuff. You know, people will take a look at you and how you're dressed and, you know, how you present yourself. And even though I had a badge, speaker, you know, you got to be part of the badge saying, you know, catering, you know, <laughs> He didn't look, you know, and he immediately assumed, you know, and actually being British and being very polite yeah. and well brought up, you know, in the British context. I was like, yeah, I'd like some tea. I'm having some tea. What would you like? I'm having Earl Grey. What would you like? You know, I thought, ah, oh, you know, tried to, you know, make a slight joke of it. But, you know, it just kept on happening. And, you know, as a woman of a certain age, you know, Ellen, you know, and I, you know, we're similar age, we've had that happen so many times. It's not that you've become inured to it, but you just kind of think, really? Is this going to keep on happening? And I'm the one who has to kind of smooth it all over, make a joke of this, you know, kind of deal with, you know, the social embarrassment of it, mm. not the other person. I also wanted to ask, I'm curious, you later learned that after that secretary episode, some of the president's aides began calling you the Russia bitch. What did that tell you about working in the Trump White House? And had other women in the White House shared uncomfortable experiences with you? Absolutely. I mean, other women had, you know, had similarly uncomfortable um, experiences, you know, after, you know, many people had left those experiences, you know, were aired, you know, they're still being aired. Mm. You know, I'd seen it happening. I'd seen, you know, him demean other people, but he had to, I have to say, he did it to men as well. I was shocked sometimes just the whole way that he talked to people, even very senior people, uh, because they were all for him, his stuff. But, you know, that was kind of his just all, all offhand comments uh, you know, the comments about people, the way that they looked, um, you know, this was just a, a, a common a common theme for him. I'm pretty thick skinned. Unlike the president, you know, I've experienced, you know, all of this and some. And, you know, I just it, it's obviously very disappointing this to be from the president of the United States. But, um, you know, he's not the first major politician or world figure who has been disparaging. You know, and I've um, had worse encounters, let's just say, you know, many of which I decided not to actually put in the book because I thought that one might be distracting. But let's just say that you know, like many other women, I've experienced much worse than, um, you know, disparaging comments in that. The book reaffirms rather than reveals uh, the, the transactional nature uh, of Donald Trump. Did you view your view of him change? Uh, Fiona, at all from the time you began working at the White House in 2017 till the time you left in July of 2019? And did you feel you understood him any better having worked for him? I certainly felt I understood him a lot better from working with him. And actually, the fact that he did ignore me, not pay attention, um, you know, enabled me to just observe him, you know, and how he interacted and, you know, kind of see the kind of person that he was. Obviously, the view changed, um, you know, from the beginning. Yes, I mean, I knew he was misogynistic. I'd heard all of the comments that he made in the campaign. I mean, this is clearly a man, you know, with um, some major personality flaws. But I also paid attention to, you know, the fact that this was campaigning. He was an entertainer. He was a showman. He was somebody who made his name in reality television, not just as a celebrity businessman. And he's also said that he was going to be incredibly presidential, he told us all, you know, when he got into the presidency. So I decided to give him at least the benefit of the doubt on that score to see how he would behave in office. You know, what I found was that um, he was all about himself. There wasn't, it wasn't the US, the larger national interest, it was all the self-interest. And that, you know, led me, you know, to see over the time, 
that we as the United States, our democracy was in real danger. I went into the administration trying to push back on Russia. As a Russia expert, I came out of the administration deeply concerned about the state of democracy and what Donald Trump himself as an individual was doing, you know, to basically pervert, distort and degrade democracy because he was somebody who always put himself first. He wasn't somebody who was, you know, kind of open to advice, you know, from even, you know, the closest people around him. He wasn't out there, you know, to try to, you know, really fulfill the, the demands and the aspirations and hopes of his voters who had put a lot of store in him and who, you know, still believed in him. He was just trying to kind of feed off that adulation, you know, from the crowds. You know, he did, you know, uh, try to, and to some degree to, you know, unleash the kind of animal spirits of the economy to get people into jobs. But these were jobs without protections. He was kind of, you know, much more interested in having businessmen like himself, billionaires, millionaires, you know, make more money, focused in on the stock market, not on, you know, kind of workers' rights and workers' pretensions. I mean, he was um, protections. He was always still busting up unions. But he did want to make sure that he delivered on his campaign promises. You know, he was someone who was out there to build the wall, to do, you know, many of the things that he said he would do uh, during his campaign to show that he was, you know, a man of his word. But it was all populist artifice. It was all about the show, um, about him and, you know, getting people to believe in him as an individual, not even him as the president of the United States, but him as the man in the White House. Did he do anything that surprised you, that you thought he maybe wasn't capable of doing, but he actually did it? with respect to Russia, for instance, or, or or anything in the foreign policy world? Well, look, I think that he didn't get credit for, you know, some of the things that he did do that, you know, he should have done. He probably headed off, you know, for quite some time, um, the risk of uh, a real collision with North Korea. When he came in, you know, he was warned by President Obama that we're heading on a really dangerous course with North Korea. Kim Jong-un was testing out weapons. He clearly had a, an aspiration to make a demonstration, a show of force that might have, you know, uh, hit a missile, you know, on um, some far-flung um, U.S. territory or even closer to U.S. shores. I mean, you're originally from Hawaii. I mean, remember the horrible episode in which there was a false alarm about a missile strike. We were on alert for this. People have forgotten that. And Trump actually diverted it. Um, he did not succeed, obviously, in... Um, getting Kim Jong-un to the table to, you know, negotiate a full arms control agreement. But he did sort of divert Kim Jong-un away from those performances of, you know, missile um, uh, exercises for some period of time. You know, arguably, you know, he basically took down those tensions um, by, you know, some rather bizarre displays of personal diplomacy. But, you know, that diffused that situation for a period of time. It didn't, you know, solve the problem, but it diffused it. He was pretty serious about having an arms control um, agreement with the Russians. It's just he was just never disciplined in terms of carrying that out. He thought that if he sat down with Putin, gazed into Putin's eyes and the two of them would see fellow strongmen and just the force of their individual charismas would bring, you know, all of this to fruition. He was very focused on the nuclear threat. I mean, that resonated with me as somebody who thought about throwing myself in a ditch as a teenager. You know, great. You know, I'm really glad that he's, you know, focused on this, but he just didn't have the self-discipline to basically pull this off and he wouldn't evolve, you know, basically the responsibility for negotiations off to someone else either. He asked a lot of tough questions, questions that we should have been asking ourselves. He put a harsh spotlight on the state of our democracy. He stress tested all of our institutions. We, we should have paid a lot more attention to this. But of course, the most shocking thing that he did was very negative in terms of his desire to stay in power and the things that he did and the lengths that he went to that started to become evident in 2019 when he was kind of gearing up to use Ukraine to sort of privatize national security and foreign policy to try to undermine the candidacy of um, Joe Biden. So that was a very shocking because it became very clear that he intended to do whatever it took, no matter how dirty, to stay in power. And you didn't really actually realize that until after you left. Is that right? I kind of, you know, was, there was a lot of things that I was worried about. I was very yeah. concerned about. I raised alarms about. I talked to Ambassador Bolton about. It mm -hmm. was only when I, like everybody else, read the transcript of a phone call that I wasn't there. You know, I'd, I'd left the week or so beforehand and realized that he himself was trying to direct the president of Ukraine to open up investigations into Joe and Hunter Biden that, you know, 
this is what was going on. This was the beginning of, you know, what I later called a self-coup, an effort to stay in power no matter what. And then, of course, he starts, you know, after I've left and we're all hearing it, to talk down the 2020 election, to talk down the security of the election, to cast doubt on the credibility of our electoral systems. The United States has had some of the, the best, uh, the, the standard bearer, the gold standard of elections that have been admired from around the world, the conduct of our elections. And here's him, the, you know, the president of the United States, the sitting president, basically questioning the integrity of uh, the United States electoral systems and you know, the functioning of our democracy. Uh, this wasn't an outside actor. It was the president of the United States. In a recent interview with Terry Gross on Fresh Air, you said, the United States is teetering on the edge of violence here. We're already in a cold civil war. Alarms are all going off on every front. Our democracy is in serious danger. Do you feel we're at a pivotal moment in our history, at a crossroads? What's we are. Like no, absolutely, I, I do. And look, you know, during the 2020 election, the people I've been working with behind the scenes in the US government tried to push back against Russian election interference and you know, other external actors, found themselves having to speak out in defense of the elections against their own president. People like Chris Krebs, who was my counterpart at the Department of Homeland Security, for example. Yeah. You know, some people watching this may have seen on television. I mean, what an astounding situation to find yourself in. You know, basically you're there to push back against international security risks, and it's domestic that you're worried about. Uh, we've seen violence. Look what happened in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. Um, look what happened, you know, during the Black Lives Matter um, uh, protests and demonstrations and in Oregon and in the streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin. I mean, that's my, my, my family are from uh, that part of uh, Wisconsin, Kenosha County. You know, this is just we we're already there. The attempts to seize the state house in Michigan, at, you know, the, the threats against the governor of Michigan and the governor of Virginia. And then, of course, the storming of the Capitol building on January 6th. We're already there. Violence is already happening. We've already had violent acts of domestic terror in the United States. Timothy McVeigh and the Oklahoma um, you know, city bombing. Um, bombings you know, during the Atlanta Olympics. You know, we're there. We're, we're a country that has known a lot of violence, continuous violence, gun violence on our streets, armed militias. This is you know, what I mean by you know, cold civil war with hot episodes. But what we're having now is the polarization of the country. I did a... Um, uh, C-SPAN Washington Journal uh, today, you know, where they have call-ins. Yes. And I knew this, but, you know, something it attracted my attention that the callers have three different buttons, one for Democrats, one for independents, one for Republicans. That's the primary identification for people now in the United States, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, whether you're red or blue America. And for those of us who are none of those things, you know, independent, you know, unaffiliated, where do you fit in? I mean, people uh, in polling are saying that, the primary identification for them is not whether they're Catholic or Protestant or this race or that race, it's whether they're Democrat or Republican. And they would not like a member of their family to marry someone from the opposing side. Mm. This is nuts. I mean, you know, it's, it's as simple as that. This is not the America that I came to in 1989. Yes, I got a shock to the system by the racial divisions and you know some of the other things that were happening there. But when I met an American, they didn't say to me, hello, I'm a Democrat or hello, I'm a Republican. I'm red, I'm blue. I mean, this was not, it's not the America I came to. People were interested in you and your background. You had multiple identities. You know, you weren't defined by something narrow. People didn't vote just on one issue. You know, for example, everything has become polarized. That's, you know, while we're in danger. If you could briefly, because I know you, you give policies prescriptions, but just how, what needs to happen between now and, you know, say 2024 to sort of, lessen the toxicity pervading American politics uh, is to strengthen democratic institutions. Well, some things absolutely have to be done at the top. And I mean, this, you know, Ellen and you and your colleagues at the Post and in the media, and you write about this all the time. I mean, there needs to be a, a proper reckoning of what happened on January 6th from the commission. You know, we need to um, accept that, you know, there is a division of powers. It's not just the president not even an executive branch anymore, president and everybody else. I mean, you know, the, the, the country was built up on institutions of checks and balances, the judiciary, the third estate of uh, journalism and the media, Congress, um, you know, that has its own oversight rights. And, you know, that was all being thrown out of the window, including in the two impeachment trials, the denial of Congress to play a role in oversight of presidential conduct. 
or of you know the conduct of uh, of matters of the state. So we have to be able to restore that. Members of Congress have to remember that they've taken an oath to the country and to the constitution and to serve in their constituencies, not just the, you know, the group of people who voted for them. This nationalization of politics and of partisan politics can only be, only be remedied by people at the top having the courage to stand up and remember that they're Americans first. They're not part of some blue you know, and red teams for some sort of sporting event talking about win and loss and you know, victory and defeat. I mean, these, this is a sporting analogy. It's, this is not about a sporting event. This isn't a game. You know, people's lives are on the line here. People want them to govern and to you know, come up with and pass an infrastructure bill and to you know, change their, you know, their lives in some meaningful way. So that has to be tackled at the top. But there's an awful lot of things that we can be doing in our communities and state and local government levels. You know, we have mayors and governors you know, who can play very important roles, but we also have civil society you know, public and private um, efforts um, that can be, you know, melded together at a community level. People can go out in their own neighbourhood and do something for their neighbours. I mean, America's full of, um, you know, these kind of stories of incredible individual courage and collective action, uh, I guess, uh, and against the backdrop of, you know, the COVID epidemic. All the people who every day go onto the front lines of hospitals, went to grocery stores, you know, when everything was closed down. People who were, you know, trying to, distribute um, goods across the country. We, we never you know, give people like this credence, but this is all part of the fabric of a society that we can embrace. And at the back of the book, I you know, start to say about what people could do themselves individually to create some collective action. And speaking out, speaking out for the truth, engaging in discussions, you know, like these kinds of venues, world affairs councils, councils of foreign relations around the country, town halls, through public libraries and public schools, we've all got a role to play. People can go to be election monitors. They don't have to go there as part of some, you know, effort that's very partisan. You know, people can go there as concerned citizens and sign up to be election monitors, for example. Lots of things that people can do. I'm taking a few questions now from the audience. And one of our uh, audience members asks, would like to know Fiona's opinion about John Bolton not testifying based on your experience working with him. I was obviously disappointed uh, that he wasn't given an opportunity to testify. He was holding out, obviously, for the Senate, for where you know he thought that the real action would be, but he was outmaneuvered. You know, people leaked the contents of his book, um, you know, making it kind of uh, clear that um, you know he was going to take a very a certain stance on this. Um, you know, obviously, you know, kind of I wish that he'd been um, able to testify in front of uh, Congress. I mean, he was in a different situation uh, from me. He had much more direct contact in the time that he was national security advisor with the president. He heard an awful lot of things the president said personally to him. Uh, there was a, a legal case going, you know, kind of through the courts that was taking an awful lot of time. You know, people ran the clock out on him that he was, you know, trying to get the legal uh, framework there to testify. So, yeah, I was disappointed, but I related you know, things that he'd told me, and he'd obviously told them to me purposefully. You know, as he'd said, he wanted me to, you know, go and tell the White House, uh, the National Security um, Council lawyers, for example, that he wasn't part of, you know, what he described as this drug, drug deal to kind of cook up, um, you know, Ukraine getting a meeting in the Oval Office, Ukrainian president, in return for um, basically declaring investigations into Joe Biden and to Hunter Biden, for example. You know, he um, you know, was clearly making, um, passing on messages to me that you know, he intended me to relate. Another question we have, how do we address the rampant corruption of foreign aid use? Foreign officials often misuse aid funds and then claim the West isn't doing enough. Yeah, well, we've had massive revelations of this through the Pandora Papers that came out through, you know, your publication, the Washington Post, and the whole group of investigative journalists. And all is that we've got to clean up our own act because, you know, we've discovered as a result of the Pandora Papers, a lot of that money comes back to the United States. You know, it's paid out in foreign aid to the leaders of uh, countries, and they stash it, you know, back in shell companies and um, havens in uh, 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 absurdly bizarre places like South Dakota. It's not the right. Seychelles and the Cayman Islands or Monaco and all the places that you think about this. London is another you know, venue for people to stash this money away. It's actually happening here in the United States. So we can address that 
by closing up those financial loopholes that enable people to create offshore companies and uh, shell companies. It's as much about us, you know, dealing with um, illicit financial flows as it is about, you know, trying to get a handle on the, the foreign assistance itself. And I think there is a lot of uh, bipartisan efforts uh, that came out under the a National Defense um, Authorization Act to kind of clo close up some of uh, this um, uh, possibility for financial impropriety. So a lot of this stuff can be done at home and with our allies as well. Another audience member says, I don't feel a sense of urgency coming from the Democrats on the threats to our democracy and the danger we are in as a society. Have you spoken with anyone in Washington about your fears and concerns? Well, I've been speaking openly, very publicly in the media over this last week, you know, ringing alarm bells. I've been on far too many, you know, kind of uh, TV programs to even, you know, keep track of them all, um, you know, using the platform of the issuing of the book to raise the alarms. I mean, people that I've talked to on and around Capitol Hill in the professional staff are so well aware of um, uh, the, the state of crisis I've encountered in the green rooms of, you know, some of the TV, uh, you know, programs, democratic um, officials who are out there, you know, also um, talking about this. But I don't think that you're, you're right. I mean, the, the question is right that there's enough of a sufficient sense of urgency because I don't think people really understand that it could happen here. I think President Biden does. I mean, he has been around in US politics for an extraordinary length of time. If you listen very carefully to things he's said publicly, that he, he is shocked himself by the state of partisan infighting, the threats to our democracy. He understands that, you know, the, the Build Back Better program that he's trying to promote, the infrastructure bill, the reconciliation bill, will show that democracy can deliver. He's trying to, you know, reach out across partisan divides, but he's, you know, dealing with infighting within his own party but he's, he's like one man who kind of gets it but can't pull everybody else along behind him you know and i just hope that by people like myself and others speaking out who are not partisan you know not steeped in uh, democratic or republican party politics people start to listen i know there's many people like myself immigrants like you know my um you know former colleague from national security council lieutenant colonel vindman who were just saying look you know we come from other societies we come from and in his case he came from the former Soviet Union, you know, mm -hmm. places that people left because opportunity wasn't there, because democracy wasn't there. And we came to the United States, our families came to the United States to, you know, build a better lives for ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, in a country that stood for the truth, in a country that was the land of opportunity for us. America is throwing away the truth. This isn't the country that we thought we were coming to, you know, in the whole period from the 70s and 80s onwards. <laughs> As a, as a white European immigrant to the United States, Fiona, do you see any way to diffuse the issue and turn immigration into something seen as positive for the country? The whole country was built up on immigration. I mean, if you're not a Native American, you know, you weren't here first. Everybody has come at some point. Everybody has some history in their background here of immigration. And at different points, white Europeans were also discriminated against. Italians, Irish, you know, there wasn't that kind of common sense of whiteness in the periods when they came. They were discriminated against sometimes on the color of their skin. Italians were disparaged from having darker skin tones than Northern Europeans, for example, disparaged from being Catholics. You know, we've we've had that. Jewish Americans, you know, who uh, had white skin, they were discriminated against on the basis of their religion. You know, there are not categories from uh, people from the Middle East who, um, you know, are um, maybe Christians or Muslims, but, you know, who may be also characterized as white because of the basis of their skin tone. They're certainly discriminated against as well. So the, the country has a long history, unfortunately, of discrimination against different waves of immigrant groups. You yourself, I mean, have experienced that, you know, growing up in Hawaii from an Asian uh, background, the discrimination that has, you know, come with this. You know, the country has always grappled with the fact that we are an immigrant country, a country that's built up on successive ways of immigration. It's been positive for the country. The country was built on immigration. And of course, you know, the first peoples, the Native Americans, were discriminated against and were pushed out of, you know, their territories. They're the most marginalized uh, community in the United States uh, today. And, you know, they themselves have been saying for a long time, look, you know, <laughs> we didn't have visas on the border, you know, when you came. There was no kind of customs officials standing, waiting, you know, kind of for the pilgrims as, you know, they kind of came off at Plymouth Rock or, you know, wherever they came. They just had to deal with it. 
And, you know, the United States, the whole history is one of immigration and of adaptation and of immigrants building a new society. So I think we just have to accept that and move on with it and, you know, realize that immigration obviously has to be brought under some control. There has to be rules and regulations. And, you know, people are always worried about the fast pace of change when things are not regulated and when we don't feel that we have control in our, our hands around that. But we need to have a sensible national level discussion about immigration. I have a question from the audience that says, what went through your head on January 6th? Were you surprised or shocked? You started to address this, but do you feel like Democrats have done enough to hold those responsible to account? I wasn't surprised, unfortunately, by the violence and, you know, the kind of the mob mentality that had emerged because, you know, we'd been there before. But I was shocked that uh, people stormed the Capitol and that they were storming it as if it was an alien citadel. That there was an idea, it was like the storming of the Bastille during the French Revolution, which was, you know, obviously a a massive fortress in Paris that was seen as a, a symbol of oppression or the storming of the Winter Palace during the Russian Revolution, when the Tsar you know, was also seen as the you know, object of oppression. And this is the House of Congress, the House of the People, we the people of the United States. It's seen as a symbol of oppression or a citadel that has to be taken by you know, kind of a group of people from you know, fellow Americans. And the, you know, the Capitol Police are beaten you know, with uh, the barricades and uh, with fire extinguishers. Yes, that was shocking. And then, you know, the whole threats to members of Congress, they didn't care, you know, the people went in, whether they were Republicans or Democrats, they wanted to lynch uh, Vice President Pence. This was all in the service of one man, you know, to basically seize um, the, the Capitol to stop and to halt the formal certification of uh, the Electoral College votes and the handing over of executive power. So it was to pervert democracy. Yes, that was shocking. So if you could make one policy or legislative fix to to improve systemically uh, the the way our government operates to perhaps prevent a future president of whatever party uh, of, 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 you know, someone who's even more capable than perhaps Donald Trump being a populist politician from from taking over and doing things to our country, our democracy that would even more harmful. What would that one fix be? Can you think of anything? Well, part of it is, you know, kind of the rigor in which presidential candidates are chosen. There isn't any. (laughs) I mean, you know, you and I, anybody can run for president if we can get enough money and we can, you know, basically take control of a party apparatus. Donald Trump wasn't a Republican. Bernie Sanders, actually, when he was running, you know, for the Democratic uh, candidacy was a self-styled a socialist and someone who is an independent. The parties have no real system for basically saying who is the representative of that party. The presidential election is a beauty contest, a popularity contest. That was going to be where I would fix it. And I would also be very, you know, kind of cognizant of talking about, you know, the deficiencies now of the presidency in the United States. It's really more from what was intended, certainly by the, uh, the founding fathers and you know, someone like George Washington, it wasn't, they didn't en- envisage the party system. They didn't envisage, you know, the fact that somebody could hijack this apparatus to, you know, get themselves elected and that then there would be no accountability to the party at all. No accountability, you know, whatsoever. And the presidency is too many things in one. It's the head of state. So there's no fail safe, you know, if the president turns out to be a would be tyrant. They're the chief executive. So that the head of the cabinet, they run the show and they're the commander in chief. They're the be all and the end all. That is not the premise of the US Constitution. So the checks and balances in the system have been eroded you know, by those who you know, wanted to put much more store in the executive branch. Yes. They, they, they were thinking of a branch, a whole executive branch, not the executive of one person. So the many people who supported a stronger executive in previous governments or previous administrations never envisaged that they were creating you know, the kind of the seeds of tyranny. They thought they were strengthening the executive branch, the office of the president and the cabinet and everybody else who is around them, you know, themselves included. Not that they were basically um, providing a platform for one person to be able to uh, take power. So it's the party system and the way that we envisage the presidency that have become the problems here. And in the few minutes we have left, I have a couple of questions that you could perhaps combine into one answer. One is if you could make one policy fix or change to help boost 
opportunity across the country, what would it be? And based on your experience of growing up in Northeastern England, what would you say about the destructive capabilities of classism that have emerged in the USA? So the well, these are two are combined, actually, as you're guessing as well, Ellen, because yeah. education has become the new dividing line for class. It's not accent or, you know, which part of the country you're from. It's not even race, you know, in that regard. It's whether you have got an advanced education beyond high school. And you know, we are seeing that the opportunities for Americans from all backgrounds, of course, it's much worse if you're a woman or you're black or, you know, from other disadvantaged minority group, if you haven't got that education, that's the double disadvantage. But if you don't have something beyond high school, you are not going to be able to find a decent job that will sustain you and your family in this new knowledge-based economy. And so we have to figure out how we make the education system work for all Americans so that all Americans can have an opportunity. They don't all have to go to an Ivy League school or, you know, kind of a four-year college, but community college. This is, you know, one of the ideas that uh, President Biden's latched on. He knows this. You know, giving um, Americans the opportunity for any kind of education, get qualification, getting these qualifications recognized across the entire country. So if you get training as a plumber or a solar panel engineer, an HVAC engineer, your qualification is recognized across the whole country. So you can find a job no matter where you are and wherever you go, that you have training opportunities. I think this is a public-private exercise. It's not just going to be the government that fixes this because the private sector, our big businesses in America, are desperate for qualified workers because, you know, the, the um, assembly lines, you know, the, the industries that are, are there are much more knowledge intensive, they're more sophisticated. People also have to have the skills that are adaptable, that they can change. The care economy is an enormous growing uh, part of the economy. My father went from being a coal miner to an orderly in the hospital. My mother was a nurse. You know, one of the fastest growing sectors is in the care economy, training people, you know, giving them the wherewithal to be carers, not just child care, but elder care, um, you know, more people involved in hospitals and, you know, the larger um, healthcare economy. There are all kinds of sectors there, but they require more training qualifications and also benefits for workers because so many people are really struggling here. Uh, the whole weight of educational debt. I was incredibly fortunate to get grants for my entire education. I graduated without any educational debt whatsoever. And that should be possible, you know, for other people in the United States. Well, it's not just an individual investment. It's an investment in our human capital. The country is not competitive. You know, this is not a country that, you know, kind of is really standing up for itself and, you know, building an economy forward into the future if people are struggling under the burdens of educational debt. And so, you know, getting that sorted out, particularly for people who go into the public sector, you know, we're losing people who are educators in the school system because they just can't afford to be teachers. You know, we need to get this aspect fixed. This is a serious discussion that we have to have in the United States about fixing our education system. So it's fixed for everybody, not just for a select few. We have one last audience question, Fiona. It is, what keeps you up at night or worries you the most? Well, I'm worried really right now about the fate of American democracy. You know, like I'm, I'm saying, that's what keeps me up at night. It's what made me, you know, write the book, you know, because I don't want it to be that there's nothing here in the United States for all of us either. And, and you know, I came to the United States um, for graduate school. I came, you know, obviously in a very privileged uh, fashion. I mean, you know, I didn't come you know, across the border or, you know, kind of uh, immigrate here with my you know, family and, you know, have to, you know, really sort of struggle um, to make a life for myself here. I was, you know, immediately vaulted off into a, you know, a different category here. But I saw the promise of the United States. I love the United States. I became a citizen here by choice, like so many other people have. And I really value this country. And I know that, you know, we can we can fix this. It's just going to take a lot of collective action. But it keeps me up at night worrying that I see so many people not realizing the peril we're in and, you know, being willing, unfortunately, to throw this all away, sometimes for just pure personal gain. That keeps me up. Well, our thanks to you, Fiona Hill, for joining us today and discussing your fantastic new book, There's Nothing For You Here, Finding Opportunity in the 21st Century. We'd also like to thank our audience for watching and participating live. 
If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash events. I'm Ellen Nakashima. Thank you. Stay safe and healthy. And thank you for me too.